I'm here today with Professor Wendy Brown, Professor of Political Science at University of California, Berkeley. We're here to discuss her book, Undoing the Demos, Neoliberalism's Stealth Revolution, published in March of 2015 by Zone Books. Wendy, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. Neoliberalism's Stealth Revolution. What does that mean? What I wanted to do in this book was take us a little past the usual understandings of neoliberalism. And I'll say just a word about that. Conventionally, we understand it as a reaction to Keynesianism, a reaction to the welfare state, a promulgation of free markets, an insistence that markets left alone and ungoverned by states, not intervened in by governments, and um, produced everywhere and for everything would just make the best possible world for all. And certainly there is that dimension to neoliberalism. So that you're saying that in that schema, anything the state does is inefficient or detracts from the potential well-being of society. Most neoliberals will acknowledge that the state should be in charge of defense, mm -hmm. provide basic security, secure rights. Okay. Now, the content of those things is another question. Most neoliberals will argue that even there, there's room for markets, mm -hmm. that the state ought to do those things by producing markets in them, but still needs to be in charge of them. But close that bracket for the moment. Um, for the most part, neoliberalism is understood as something that is about letting markets have their way and keeping the state out of the picture, except for defense, for securing rights, and for providing national security. But I wanted to take the problem of neoliberalism a little further and explore something that it's done to political life, to social life, and to the human being. And that's where the stealth revolution comes in. What many neoliberals, especially those writing and thinking and arguing on behalf of neoliberalism in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, argued for, wasn't just free markets but the expansion of markets understood as competition to every feature of life, including democracy, including human social life, including education, social services, and so forth. So the idea wasn't just let free markets have their way, but produce everything in the image of a market. And that's where the stealth revolution comes in because that's where the transformation of the human being and the transformation of democracy itself begins to unfold. And I think those are the things we probably want to talk about and together. so the title, Undoing the Demos, yes. is what the stealth revolution right. is. Right. So above in. all, what I'm concerned with in this book is the way that turning democracy itself into a marketplace, converting the terms of democracy, the basic understanding of democracy, into a marketplace literally undoes democracy. And what I mean there is that if democracy is understood in its most basic way as rule of the people, rule of the demos, that's the ancient Greek idea, demos kratia, the people rule, once you take democracy and make it into a marketplace, you get rid of some pretty fundamental principles of democracy. And these include making equality a first principle, sharing political power equally, and having the people themselves decide what to value and decide what a particular polity ought to do, ruling themselves. And the reason you get rid of those when you convert democracy into a marketplace is that marketplaces aren't supposed to have people ruling. They're just supposed to have everyone pursuing their own interest. Mm -hmm. And they aren't supposed to have equality. They're supposed to have um, the naturalness of inequality that comes with competition. So some of the most basic features of democracy get undone by marketizing it. And that's what this book is concerned with. No. In reading this book, the other dimension, which I think is very uh, sophisticated and important that you bring out, is that you are not just romanticizing democracy as an alternative to this system. You deal with the tensions of how expertise and representation mm -hmm. and the structure of governance 
affects the well-being of people. And the notion that what I call pure representative democracy as an ideal has certain attractions, like you said, of sharing of power, making sure everyone's heard. But, but there are tensions within that, and there are people like the order liberals who would like to have a hierarchy of more expert people choosing what to do for the well-being of society. Right. But that has its vulnerabilities as well. Yes. Democracy is always an unrealized dream. And it's not as if we once upon a time had it and then neoliberalism undid it. There's always been, in modern societies, a tension between capitalism and democracy, between the inequalities that capitalist societies generate and the ideal of including all, sharing power among all, having an egalitarian political order. But the ideal was sustained by a understanding democracy and capitalism as something other than identical. Understanding democracy as something that societies had to try to aspire to and carve out a space for, and markets as something that were appropriately confined to an economic sphere. So they're a and tool exactly. to facilitate the well-being right. of the body politic. But what's changed, and even the classical political economists, Adam Smith, Adam Ferguson, and others, never argued that democracy itself or the state itself should be economized, should be turned into a market. They simply argued that where there were markets, laissez-faire should be appropriate, but they never argued that everything should be marketized. So democracy has always been in tension with markets, but at least was cultivated by honoring its basic principles and attempting to expand those to include more peoples. For example, those historically disenfranchised, African Americans in the US, women, mm -hmm. um, other peoples who were excluded, and also expand rights and expand possibilities for opportunity and expand possibilities for participation as citizens. What's changed, what neoliberalism has done by economizing democracy is saying there's no special space for democracy anymore. There's just markets everywhere and everything should be understood on a market model. It used to be said that capitalism derives its moral legitimacy from being governed by democracy. There you go. Yes. But now the buying and selling of the rules of the game or the enforcement of the rules tears apart that legitimacy. Exactly. And what's happened in response to that at some times and in some places is that people question whether we need democracy at all. Exactly. Some people point to a Chinese authoritarian government mm -hmm. as an example of something that works, that delivers the service. Others say democracy doesn't work because it requires expertise, sophistication, and a hierarchy, right. and people can't, how do you say, collectively rise up to that, whether it's because of emotional contagion or whether it's because of lack of education, something we should talk about mm -hmm. here, because you can't destroy education and depend on democracy. So let's hold that for just a second, and, sure. but first talk about the what you just mentioned in a really, I think, useful provocation, which is once democracy starts to be challenged by the ubiquitousness of markets, and markets understood as the best way to organize everything, once, once that challenge happens, the capacity of people to argue for democratic will democratic governing becomes really weakened. Markets become the solution to everything. And when that happens, you get a cycle, the one you just described, which is markets do what they will, even if they're producing greater inequalities, even if they're producing tremendous volatility and instability, even if they're crashing certain economies altogether, certain nations producing the situation that we have today in Puerto Rico or in Greece or elsewhere. Markets are still understood to be the best way of, of governing. And then you get the problem of democracy itself being essentially what you're describing, delegitimized as a response or a retort or a solution to the 
inequalities or maldistributions or utter disasters that markets sometimes mm -hmm. generate. And this and creates a spiral because when the government doesn't perform well, the lobbies to dismantle the government right. reduce their funding, reduce their training, re exactly. reduce the quality of talent that they can aspire to right. putting in senior positions. Right. So then you get that terrible and spiral, then, and which then is yes. Go ahead. That disintegrates. Right. And government can't function, and therefore it validates the cynic. Right. So it looks like a it looks like a bad form of organizing uh, society, right. and increasingly what you get are. Um, on the one hand, the idea that markets themselves should govern, or that the philanthropic desires of, and I'm saying this, you know, with, with Silicon Valley 20 miles away from us as we speak, the philanthropic desires of the head of Microsoft or the head of Facebook or whatever else ought to be making the major political moves and decisions for our society. So increasingly, the understanding of how we should organize ourselves is either let the markets rule or let the rich rule and let the rich make decisions about how do we fix education or how do we respond to poverty in North Africa or how do we respond to um, uh, disintegration of an inner city or something like that and it becomes up to the Zuckerbergs and uh, the Gates and so forth who are understood as not only experts at what they do, but now become essentially the new rulers. That's the non-nefarious side. The nefarious side is the one you just described, where um, those who are able to essentially buy legislation by uh, making tremendous contributions to uh, 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 candidates for office, and then making those contributions based on a quid pro quo, a tacit quid pro quo, if, if I get you elected, then you will make sure that so people are pre-selling policy. They're pre-selling policy. And it's just become, yeah. you know, most people know this is the case. And as you say, people kind of, as a result, become very cynical. Um, but I think also what we have now is a kind of deep confusion and even despair about what else could possibly run our world. Yes. So yeah. when you combine that with the fact that there are, and I'm now picking up an earlier point you mentioned, those who believe that democracy is just a bad way to run an economy and a bad way to run the globe, and I think this touches on some of what's going on with the European Union crisis and other things, you get the conviction that it really at this point ought to simply be a matter of experts who have the authority to decide which policies should be pursued, which policies should be avoided, where austerity ought to be imposed, where it ought to be, um, where certain kinds of uh, arrangements with, between financial institutions and states and public services ought to be organized. And increasingly we have a, a belief on the one hand that that ought to be organized by experts and a despair on the other that governments are hopeless, markets are out of control, the world is too complex and too vast, and it's either doomsday or I'll just go shopping. What you say in your book is that our belief, there's like a decline in the belief in the modern. There's yes. a decline in the belief that human agency can be used to repair Yes. these things and it, it's that despondency that along with the challenge of creating an affirmative vision or critiquing the neoliberal vision that triad is almost insurmountable. It's so important Rob that you mentioned that because I think that in many ways the idea that we are in a an age of extraordinary technological innovation and that technology holds the solution to everything has almost produced a kind of cover or, or, or a layer of denial that sits atop what is a very deep despair about being able to come together as a people, as a demos, and decide how we should live, what our problems are, 
how they should be fixed. And I think that despair ranges across everything from what do we do about global financial institutions to what do we do about global warming. That sense that modernity brought us the idea that human beings, rather than nature, rather than gods, and rather than tradition, human beings could be in charge of their own lives, their own future, and could exercise freedom in coming together with others and deciding individually how to live. Mm -hmm. And that was the promise of modernity. Uh, if there was one big promise of modernity, modernity, it was that no longer did these things have to be determined by forces of nature or forces ritual of divinity or, or ritual <laughs> sacrifice or the alignment of the stars. Mm -hmm that reason, deliberation, and democratic organization was the way that modern human beings would take control of their lives and exercise their freedom to be um, creatures of, of mind and of will who could do that. And I think at this point in history, we're actually seeing that, that hope, that promise, that belief turn inside out and turn into a kind of... Uh, deep but often unavowed conviction that everything's out of control and uh, and filling the void of out of control yes is faith in markets there you go yes what how deserving is that well I'm afraid you and I probably agree that that faith in markets is 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 not founded um, that markets certainly can do certain things, but faith in markets to determine our future and to right themselves and to govern us uh, is, is inappropriate. I also think there are some quotidian things you can say about markets, things like you know, what Thomas Piketty underscored that I think many economists knew, but he just made it really bold with his 800-page tome by <laughs> saying, <laughs> Look, the thing about markets, when they're really left to themselves, is they do one very simple thing. They generate capital accumulation at a much greater rate than they generate growth. And when that happens, what you get is increasing concentration of wealth at the top, increasing impoverishment across society, and a fairly stagnant economy. And when that happens, what you get in turn, he argued, is basically a form of neo-feudalism, a kind of stagnant economy with an oligarchic class uh, ruling over it and engaged in rent extraction rather than productive uh, or growth-based, it's another subject, the question of growth, but or growth-based economic development. And you know, Piketty is working, as you know, very much inside the bounds of economics, but called out free markets as not doing what economics basically says it's supposed to do, which is generate the most productive, successful, growing economy that they possibly could. He said, no, it actually does the opposite. Right. Left alone, this is the danger. And the promise of mobility and transition, it's as if the drawbridge gets pulled up by exactly. the oligarchy. Exactly. I mean, what he focuses on is the extent to which once wealth gets concentrated like that, law in turn gets organized by that oligarchy to make sure that it's not transmitted anywhere except to their own future generations. Mm -hmm. And once that happens, you put an end to equality of opportunity. You've, you've basically secured a world in which uh, there's no social mobility at all. So you put an end to another promise of modernity, which is that everyone gets included in at least the prospect of being able to develop who and what they want to be, even if we have uneven starting lines, even if it's not a completely level field, playing field. What Piketty argues is once, once you have a truly free market world of that sort, you get um, an absolute stall in social mobility. It's as uh, Pierre Bordeaux, the French sociologist, once said, the spirit in the castle is in the drawbridge. There you go. And, That's beautiful. Uh, 